before we start the podcast, we just wanted to let you guys know that a marching band decided to practice for the duration of our podcast, yet we still decided to publish it, and so there you have it. It's not too distracting between the coughs and the marching band and the occasional church bells from across the street. Nonetheless, enjoy, and thank you for your cooperation and understanding. Welcome to in Dev Podcast, that's humanity, always in development. We're a peculiar blog functioning as a subsidiary of Upbound Online. You can find us on the internet at indev.news, that's I-N-D-E-V dot N-E-W-S, as well as your typical social network platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and the like. Again... That's InDev Podcast. I am your host, Arm of Justice, a.k.a. Donald. Introduce yourself, sir. As always, I am Anthony, your amazing, insightful, hilarious, and uh, all-around great guy, Anthony. I would not go that far. I would, and I did. Huh. Well... Moving on, then. <laughs> nope, this is um, also your co-editor. Um, Anthony, I would encourage the new folks out there um, to check out indev.news, as that is our new URL. And it is live. We're going to be populating it with more content as we go forward. So I encourage the good people of the internet to really take a good look at this reboot of our website. Yes, the sequel. The second coming. This is indev.news. We will also uh, apologize in advance. Anthony is still going, getting over a cold. I am still getting over a cold, which only got worse as the week went on. So <clears throat> background coughing and noises will happen. Um, so we do apologize in advance. That being said, the show must go on. Indeed it must. So we're still playing with our uh, format for this uh, particular show. But I do uh, want to introduce a sort of pseudo-social block that can be tech-infused. It may not be tech-infused, um, but we're going to start off with this little bit of a social block. And today, um, we want to talk about the Apple effect. Why can they get away with what others cannot? They can't. Spoiler alert, they can't. Oh, but I think they can. Hence the debate. So I came up with this idea because I was pondering Apple Watch sales. Um, There was a recent report, and I'm going to try to find the link and put it in the rundown, but there was a recent support that suggested that Apple had sold something like 4.7, like... Billion, trillion Apple Watches? Only a million. They haven't taken over the world just yet. Um, But they sold a hell of a lot of smartwatches in a market that is not really tailored to smartwatches. It's not really sort of uh, booming if you will, and then their next uh, competitor, Samsung, their next uh, closest competitor only sold something like 600,000 units. Um, granted, the Gear S2 isn't, you know, fully, fully, you know, shipping. I mean, it is shipping at this point, but, you know, it's not your most common device. Um, you can probably still find the Gear Fit faster than you can find the, uh, the Gear S2. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, Apple seems to be selling a whole bunch of smartwatches. So I got to thinking, wow, um, it seems like Apple over the years, for one reason or the other, uh, has been able to get away with a lot. Um, but you seem to disagree. Well, I disagree that for whatever million is a lot. It's certainly not a lot for Apple. And um, anecdotally, it doesn't seem like the people who have bought an Apple Watch find it as useful as they would have otherwise assumed it would be. Um, and I think the real story is Apple Watch 2. If that sells better than its predecessor, which, you know, it probably will, then we can say that Apple's getting away with something that other people have not. But if it doesn't, then clearly the smartwatch... Uh, form factor, maybe just the smartwatch market for iPhones is not as 
profitable or desirable as people, you know, assumed it would be. You know, I I hear what you're saying. I think Apple is disappointed in their own numbers. I think that for them, they wanted a home run, and that's not what they got. Um, and I think that I also think that they have you know sixteen times or whatever the math is times their next you know next best competitor in Samsung no less, and so I think that in terms of the smart watch market, they have boomed and blew past Pebble, Samsung, um, Asus, and the fact that I'm already even slowing down and um, retelling who's out there shows you just how sparse the market gets after. You name Apple, Samsung, and Pebble. I mean, you have Huawei, you have Moto. I mean, they have pretty good sales. Um, but in comparison to Apple, no one's really um, soaring through the sky like Apple is. But that's not by virtue of the fact that the Apple Watch is somehow fundamentally better or that Apple has tapped into some um, un unused market or like it's not like apple is doing anything substantially different than everyone else it's just that apple is larger and by virtue of how large the company is and the resources they have at their disposal they can do things that other companies can't you wouldn't expect apple to sell less apple watches than pebble because pebble is a tiny company by comparison now you do bring up samsung and i'd say that samsung has been victim of uh their unfocused devices as far as their wearables go. And I think that contributed because Samsung has a handful of wearables out there. And I'm not sure if that, that number that you gave was just for that specific SKU or all of them in general, but I know that they've been selling, you know, a handful of them since they came out a couple years ago. And I can't imagine them being that far away from a couple million. I mean, even Pebble has sold over a million at this point. No, right. I mean, I think um, what I was saying was Samsung sold 600000 in in the comparable quarter as compared okay. to Apple. Okay. And so that actually is not even one skew. It combines every product that they still sell. Think about that. You know? So when thinking about Apple, yeah, they're more focused. And I agree. I don't think it has anything to do with innovation. In fact, my whole point is they're getting away with a lot of stuff. Imagine if Android Wear came out or Tizen for Samsung or whatever, even Pebble to some extent. And Pebble does this a little bit. And they said, oh, uh, by the way, we stream our apps from the phone. And so there's nothing running native on the watch necessarily. Only very few things are running natively on your watch. Um, the reason why is because it's so underpowered to keep the battery life and the other aesthetic things we want at the forefront. Kind of like how our phones have still you know, 1,700 milliamp hour batteries in our lower models. Imagine if you were Samsung and saying that. I mean, every tech reviewer would pick that apart left and right. You know, but Apple gets away with that um, to some extent. I mean, I think people call them out. And I actually think tech reviewers were honest about um, their Apple Watch review. But your general consumer doesn't give a damn. But those type of things come up and those type of critiques come up when you're talking about walking into a carrier store or a Best Buy and asking, you know, the person who wants to sell you something, you know, when they try to sell you an iPhone 6, they don't mention that the iPhone 6 is roughly a 720p display, but let you walk over to the Android SKU that's not a Galaxy, and they'll be the first ones to tell you, and oh, that's a 720p screen and all that stuff. You really want this device, the Apple, the iPhone 6. It's like the best device on the market right now, best app support. But wait, it, it has the internals of a Nexus. Now, grant you, the Nexus 4 that came out in 2012 didn't have you know, the optimization that Apple has because it's such a closed platform. But the shit was buttery smooth. And so to me, I just didn't think in general, Apple gets away with a lot of stuff. And I have a historical premise why. Well, I mean, I would, I would agree it's the halo effect of Apple. Um, what do you mean? It, they, I mean, since the iPod revolution and the subsequent iPhone and everything, uh, the company's just been, you know, they are in a dominant position. They have, they've done something in a way that not many companies have been able to do in the sense that they've brought marketing very, very close to um, the consumer in a way that 
it makes the cons it inspires in the consumer this need for something that is purely a luxury device. And I've seen people with Apple Watches. I've inquired as to the use case, and fundamentally, it's uh, I won't say superficial, but it's largely it's a it's like a superfluous device. It's not necessary, and it's a status symbol. Form over function. Yeah, people who wear, you know, really expensive watches don't wear them because they're fundamentally better than like a cheap dollar store watch. They wear them because of the status. Apple has status. People buy it because they can. Uh, you know, consistent performance and all that stuff aside, Apple is is vogue. It's hip. It's chic now. And I mean, will it remain that way indefinitely? A hundred percent, no. Like you can quote me on that because even Rome fell, you know, like no, no kingdom lasts forever. <laughs> okay. So Anthony's, uh, he's preaching now. He's, he's made a prediction folks. So stay tuned. Let's we'll see what it, a- it, Apple's doing. It's, it's not like a, it's not like some radical prediction. It's a, it's a pretty common sense fact that in a hundred years from now, I highly doubt that Apple will remain in such a position in the market the market will be completely different who knows well, i mean the, know? the context of the planet will be different laws governing corporations will be different so you I know mean, i think 100 years is interesting but what i what i what i feel is um possible rebuttal to your point is the 21st century effect that i just invented um <laughs> it's the idea that um after a certain point we get used to we get we hit a ceiling of excellence and it's everything is so iterative and um, the way things fall is not by like the way that like Apple used to fall or IBM. I mean those ways that you know stocks and all that stuff like that could happen. But if you maintain a certain level of excellence, I think you can continue it because everything is so monitored and published on the internet, and we remember things uh, through the internet in a lot of ways. Like I wouldn't be able to tell you how people talked a hundred years ago without consulting historical sources and all that. But, you know, any micro change, uh, deviation from a religious sect, uh, um, political conflict in a country, um, the aesthetics and design language of a corporation, like when Google came up with material design, all that stuff is so present and everybody knows everything, but everybody knows that Apple is awesome. And since we're in such, in such a 21st century, everybody knows everything age, I really do uh, think that over time... Uh, Apple Apple has more chances to sustain itself. Like, for example, it's it's kind of like, and uh, stick with me here. It's kind of like how European dominance has overstated its welcome in the ebb and flow of history. Like, think about all the empires that have come and gone. But like, once we hit like the the information age, especially like that last wave of modernity in like the 17th century has really persisted in large in large part due to globalization when the eventually industrial age space age and then you know the internet age that came out of that it's hard to forget those things whereas you know empires come and gone you had to you know have written language and books to keep track of that and so i think apple is a sort of modern day version of you know uh market you know global imperialism but instead of around the globe that's in the market and so it's going to be harder for them to lose dominance because everybody knows of them but i mean see my objection to that is in that apple they they don't appeal to the the everyman in the in the sense that apple is a company that only sells premium devices that that's that's a simple fact <coughs> from 5c the iPhone 5C was not a cheap device, and guess what? They don't make those anymore. It wasn't so premium. It wasn't premium. It wasn't premium, but it wasn't affordable. So, so why did they whatever, sell so many? Whatever position it fit in, it wasn't selling in the in the markets that would be receptive to such a device. Like if I live in, I'm not going to name any countries because I'm sure inevitably I will offend someone. But if I live in a country that is, you know not among the most affluent countries, I'm not going to be looking at a $700 phone or a $600 phone or a $500 phone even. I will be looking at a phone that's cheaper that I can afford. In that way, Apple is missing out on billions of people, fundamentally. Well, they Whether they continue to do that or not, I think they're 
corporate ethos would require them to do that. And as a result, they will eventually not fade into irrelevance, but there's only so long that you can continue to... I mean, you can push premium devices indefinitely, but the amount of control you have over a market will be reduced. Like those premium watch manufacturers, it's difficult to say that they have pull over the watch market because they're so small. They only need to sell a couple of $10,000 watches because they're $10,000 watches. They don't need to push volume because they get really high margins on few uh, devices. Apple can do that indefinitely, but will they maintain the level of influence they have over markets? Probably not. I mean, look what they did with the app with uh, Apple Music. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Um, it's not doing so hot, you know. Well, I think it's they the- thought they <clears throat> thought they could break into this this market that was well established, do their own thing, and suddenly take it over, and they didn't. They failed to do that. Okay. You know? So maybe, maybe the Apple effect, as you call it, isn't as bulletproof as some would would suggest it is. Well, I mean, I think if you look at anything besides Android, um. I think it's it's got staying power. And the reason why I say that is Android looked up because they came out really early as an open platform that wasn't locked into something like Nokia's Symbian or this one's or that company's. You know, it gave one Linux-based kernel operating system that could run on middling hardware for the time and open to everyone. Now, obviously, Google started bundling their stuff, and we can talk about the antitrust comparisons to the 90s Microsoft for sure, but at the end of the day, it was still an open platform which you could make and adjust, and though Microsoft begged Samsung in 2014 to really stop and slow down, um, they really can't because they marketed it as an open platform. It was free to install. Everybody and their mother, every OEM on the planet would take it up. I wonder how many Android devices exist. And so... Apple is up against that type of uh, regime, but that regime can no longer be broken into. You know, I mean, Windows tried it, and it still has a long way to go because now it's free to in- install it on, you know, X-sized devices that are, you know, seven inches or smaller or whatever. But at the end of the day, you know, it becomes this idea that, you know, they entrenched themselves at a really key moment, Google. And um, though Apple predated them, um, they blew up when they when they came out too. And so you have these two giants um, who have control of the markets that they care about, and everybody else is floundering about. Um, even BlackBerry just released their first Android device, um, the Priv. That says something. And so for me, you know, you say the average person is not as connected. You know, granted, I, I, I agree about sort of global markets here, but Apple doesn't give a damn. You said yourself they're more focused on the the premium. And the people the people there are people who bought the five C in the US market, uh, in the European market, uh, the the Western European market, or just the European market in general. And I mean, it was just a five C. It was just a iPhone five, um, and a new chassis pretty much. And so I guess my point is, is that Apple has become the norm. And Android is that other thing that people still kind of understand, but see Galaxy as separate from. And so, and I will shout out Austin Evans for having a really cool video on this. No, I'm sorry. MKBHD. Like he was talking about like how he's describing every phone on the market, but there's these, you know, pluses and minuses because, you know, every phone isn't perfect. And then, and then the person he was talking to eventually just said, I'm just going to get an iPhone because it's easy and it works. And I can get it on a contract. And so the price doesn't hit me as bad. And when I look at the Galaxy, which is really complicated, you know, um, they're just as pricey. You know, so Apple barely hits that margin there. And obviously, for those people who want to afford more than 16 gigs, internal can do it. But the layman doesn't care about gigabytes. They just care about a phone that works, and that's really cool. And the camera's awesome, and I use Instagram. And that's about it. So I think the layman, if you will, like the average Joe, like you and me, except, you know, without the tech, you know, you know, being tech aficionados, you know, have become to see Apple as a norm. And so that's why ladies don't give a damn that the iPhone 5 the iPhone 5S, you know, had a freaking, you know, sub 720p screen or had 
battery life that was kind of shit. You know, they could take selfies on a palmable four-inch screen. If an Android device came out at that point with a four-inch screen, with the same specs, it would be it would sell nothing. And that's what 2012, 2013. But Apple could do it because that premium sort of target hipstery market has bled into sort of your everyday as well. Well, I can't really argue with that. <laughs> I can say that that is a phenomenon that we are currently experiencing. I'm skeptical that it will last because it just doesn't seem likely that we will continue over. So, yeah, we're approaching a decade of iPhone dominance. Will we see a decade two? Maybe. But these these markets historically have been so volatile in the sense that they change a lot for better and worse. I'm skeptical that it will continue to be the way that it is. You know, I basically I'll put it this way. I see Google maintaining its position with Android more so than I see Apple maintaining its position with the iPhone, at least in the global market. Yeah, the U.S. will continue to buy them because people are entrenched. But I really think your average person across the world, if we were to take a global average, they know the iPhone that doesn't necessarily mean that they want the iPhone. They certainly don't need the iPhone. Um, and that's really the story of Apple. It's the story of the iPhone because their other devices are not as compelling. Their other devices are not as successful. And um, it is really only this one device that they have that gives them the power that they currently are benefiting from. That's, so a that's hell my of a take lot. on it. Yeah. yeah. It's a hell of a lot of power, though. I mean... I'll, 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 I'll say this. Apple really didn't care about the global market um, when they first came out with the iPhone. And up until maybe a couple years ago, they were almost non-existent. App, Android had about 70-80% of the global market. Apple had 15-ish percent. And then Windows, BlackBerry, and everybody else made up the rest. And like other Android OEMs that were not you know, Samsung. Uh, made up the rest. Um, and Apple was happy with that. They were perfectly fine with that. They had one iPhone. They didn't even have the Plus at the time. They had one iPhone, and it worked for them. And what else that worked in their favor is that they're an American company. And so mind share is just as powerful as market share. And if you have mind share of one of the largest globalizers on the planet that influences the tech market, your everyday market, your tech market is already influenced. The everyday layman market of your home country is already uh, captured in a lot of ways because they fight fiercely with Google here. And then slowly but surely, the global market will come and go. And if it goes, it's fine. They have they sit on oodles of money, partly because the iPhone does so well in America, does so well in other you know, popular Western markets. And that's where they got their bread and butter from. And now... The numbers are shifting. Like, I'm not sure, but like, there's a few Asian countries that like, Apple started to gain some ground. They started to slowly penetrate China. Like, we've we've got <laughs> just you immature <laughs> bastard. I mean, <laughs> Jesus, sorry. I no, you're not. But it's fine. Um, they slowly started to infiltrate the Chinese market, if you will. No spy the pun image, intended. The imagery there is just as hilarious to me, but continue. Because 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 you're an interesting person, Anthony. I'm just going to leave it at yes. that. Um, but I think in the end of the day, I think you know, you're, you, I hear your arguments in terms of global market, and maybe that's the thing that uh, matters in the end. But I think because of the mind share of the United States and the influence that the U.S. does have in terms of how people either react to or fall in line with consumerist culture. And technology, especially, um, and social media, you know, Apple has got that. And so the Apple effect matters where it matters. And if it matters in other places, that's just a, a plus, you know, a check mark in their direction. And so 
you know, I, I challenge you to think about an Apple in the next five years. I still see Apple being extremely dominant. And maybe 10 years from now, still beyond 10 years, I don't know. We'll have to see. But because we are so, you and I are on this podcast for a reason. You know, everyone's monitoring everything. It's not like Apple before, where you can monitor this or that and any other company, and it's fine. But like, people are waiting. The current, see if the current, uh, the current monarchy holds, um, and everybody has turned their eyes to the big, you know, the big, the big apple on the top tree there, um, and so we'll have to see. Yeah, I don't know, but in the meantime, I'm still pissed off because <laughs> I don't have WebOS. I mean that that is definitely a topic for another podcast. It because is we. We have feelings about that, but I understand. I mean, my feelings about it, I don't really mind Apple. I think it's a pretty cool company. You know, they make good products. It's just I am in an environment where I am inundated with their products, not only in a social aspect, but in work, in my job. And it's particularly frustrating, you know, because I don't know. Maybe it's just a aspect of my personality, but I don't really like the homogeneity of it. Like everyone has the same device, you know, the same device, the same experience on that device. The only difference being, Oh, I've got this cool pink rubbery case on mine. (laughs) Oh, I've got this gigantic otter box, like defender plus pro, you know, military edition where if I shot this thing and blew it up with a nuke, it would be fine. Like, to me, that I can't get behind the idea that everyone has the same device as me, the same experience, and like I don't know, I'm too interested in technology to be confined to that one prescribed experience, you know. Um, yeah. But that's that's just, you know, hey, if it works for some people, it works for them. But I'm not a, I'm not really a fan. You're right. You're right. Um, I think this is a good place to move on. Uh. Our social block um, seems like it works out, and we, we'll revisit this. And every week, we'll we'll probably have something up front here. Uh, but let's move on, shall we? Uh, we could talk about this forever. Um, we could complain forever. But let's go on to um, this, uh, I guess, natural progression here of uh, what is a first world problem? Smart solutions to smart to modern problems. Um, let's think about the smartwatch, for example. We're talking about smartwatches, and I explained my niche case with the Pebble. Um, and I think, um, you broke it down very beautifully, Anthony, uh, a week or two ago. If you could please reiterate your, uh, sort of paradox or your, your breaking down that made me feel really dumb to buy a smartwatch. So, so I summarized, I came to the realization that the following was a summary of why I don't understand. Now I'm going to, I'm going to pause you for a second there. Uh, our listeners, if you happen to hear... Uh, an assortment of drums in the background. Please do note that uh, that is, I think, an impromptu celebration happening on my block, and <laughs> the podcast must go on. So just think no, of it should. as musical accompaniment. Yeah, this could be live boots on the ground reporting for yet another podcast. We gotta <laughs> investigate. We gotta find out if this is related to tech or humanity or both. It's you probably know? both. Exactly. But yeah. it's not related to smartwatches, and as a result, we must continue. We must continue. So of smartwatches, I said, the thing that confuses me about them is that it is a device that I spend a couple of hundred dollars to, to, to buy that enables me to use my other several hundred dollar device. <laughs> Bless. <laughs> that, to me, is the perfect example of a first world problem it's saying oh this 700 dollars iphone that i have in my pocket you know i really i really want to use it a a little less the battery life's not lasting i want something else so that i don't have to use it but i can still get the benefits of using it let me spend 500 dollars on this wrist device that i'll strap to my wrist and i will look at that instead of my phone now I have all of my problems solved, theoretically, by spending, you know, $1,200. Yay. 
<laughs> oh gosh. Um. So upon you know Anthony's lovely retelling of this, I felt like an idiot. I certainly did. Um, but then I took a step back, and I thought of it because I always depends on approach. And I approach the issue as this. I'm not trying to solve a problem, per se. And I, I sort of thought to myself, who are they targeting? These people who make smartwatches. What is the watch supposed to be? Or I mean a smartwatch supposed to be. Well, it's supposed to be a watch. And this is somewhat in the line of, you know, pebble thinking, right? Like, I look down, I can tell the time, right? It's a thing on my wrist, um, and I go everywhere with it. That's one strand of thinking. The other strand of thinking is, there's this thing on my wrist that does some really awesome shit. It has a screen. It looks like my smartphone. It can do a bunch of stuff that my smartphone can. Hell, I could even talk on it like a kid in Star Trek. The whole sort of Samsung approach, right, when he had those adverts, which was very compelling to me. Um, I love, side note, I love the fact that they had the, um, the Star Trek wristwatch um, from the original motion picture in 1977 or 79. Don't, no, they started shooting in 77, they published it in 79, um, and they had, like, the one time the communicator was on a wristwatch, and people didn't pick that up unless you're, like, a diehard Star Trek fan, and I love that. Of course, they had other depictions, like the Power Rangers watch, and other things that took your geeky fancy. So you have these two sort of philosophies about the smartwatch and what it's supposed to solve. Um, the one is supposed to not really solve a problem, um, but just be your watch and just do more. And the other one is supposed to be a really cool techie geeky device that's for you know tech geeks. And for a while, that's the only people who bought them. Um, but the idea at the time, in early time, that it could just, uh, in that strand of thinking that was, I'm going to buy this because it's a cool gadget, realize that the functionality isn't there. The geeky functionality really wasn't very strong. And I'm still pulling out my other very expensive device. And by the way, this is expensive as hell too. And for the people who wanted to buy this for aesthetics, all the devices were ugly. And you had to charge them in a day. And so that's part of the reason, I think, why overall the market never took off. It wasn't until the Moto 360, I think, came out and Android Wear was finally updated to do some useful stuff that people were finally like, holy crap, this is kind of useful. It could be useful. Um, and look good at the same time. And so you sort of married the two, form and function. And so when you think of someone, and they're clearly they're not targeting you know your average Joe necessarily. People who not only want to just buy a watch, but also want to buy a watch and look good, right? And have a watch that lasts. Um, you're already going to spend, like, the gift that your significant other got you. That watch has no function but telling the time in a very unique way. And at the time, it was something like 180 bucks. And if for 180 bucks, I could also buy, you know, well, at this point, you know, this Asus watch or this, um, this Pebble watch. And it also looks really good. It lasts for, you know, at least two days, three days in terms of the Asus and four to five for certain pebble skews and up to 12 and others charges really fast and it actually leaves my phone in my pocket which has gotten bigger and bulkier but the thing is the, the thing is to me that watch is not meant to um it's not meant to replace like well it's not I meant to repla replace what replace your I phone mean, or replace okay. your watch it's meant to augment your phone experience i get that but the problem I have with it is the idea of mindfulness, you know, being present in the moment. And I think, why is it suddenly that we, we have these smartwatches and people are ha using them and experience like, oh, wow, you know, I can really, you know, I can be more aware of my email notifications when I'm on the toilet or I can, you know, the, the, the use cases you explained are compelling for sure, but I think fundamentally we've been able to get by perfectly fine prior to these devices. And now suddenly they're introduced and we see problems where problems didn't exist before. That to me seems artificial, you know, we, why is it that we need these devices now in certain use cases, whereas before they existed, they didn't need them, you know? 
I understand your use case and I understand that it's useful for you, but I think fundamentally, why, why, what is the need, not the need, the obsession. I was gonna, I was gonna call you out on that word. Yeah. The, the prioritization of being always accessible, being connected, being, um, tapped in to social email business all these things i get that it's helpful from a productivity standpoint but philosophically i can't agree because it emphasizes that we 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 substitute or we we sacrifice our downtime the time that we would normally use to to to, to self-reflect to think you know you're sitting on the toilet you don't need your phone you don't need a newspaper. Why can't you just do your business and ponder, you know, on your day or your future or your past? You know, why? I think the part of the reason why, and I know this is sort of a separate issue, but it's tied into the idea of the first world problem. The idea that our, you know, the millennial generation is becoming more and more self-absorbed, uh, vapid, and plugged into the social media and their attention spans are subsequently shrinking. I think that's perhaps a result of this phenomenon where we don't allow ourselves enough time for self-reflection, for understanding, you know, to navigate the interior realm that, that, we, that we have. Like, I know that for you as someone who works, it's really important to be able to have your email because that's how you're communicated with. It helps you to do your job better. But even in that sense, though it is right for you, I think this the situation should the problem should never have arisen where you would need such a solution. You know, I, I think we ought to not push people to become oriented solely towards productivity because then we're just machines, you know, biological machines, and I don't. I don't like that. And I know that's a very far removed uh, thing to say. We're going from smartwatches to we are fundamentally machines of productivity. But I think it's not really that slippery of a slope when you consider it. So are you calling me a Cylon? Is that what you're saying? Essentially, yeah. Yeah, I am. Screw you. I am, it's okay. It's I'm loyal okay. to the I'm loyal to the fleet. Uh, <laughs> uh, please watch Battlestar Galactica. Um you know, Anthony, I hear what you're saying, and I think your argument is very salient when it comes to smartphones. You know, where I disagree um, is I, I really do disagree when it comes to. Um, all right, let me let me let me let me pull back for a second. Do you have a watch? Yes. Okay. Do you find it useful? Yes. How do you have that sense? That when you're doing your everyday life, whether you're pooping, you know, having having good love, love, uh, going to work, going to class, waking up, do you have the sense that the device just falls away until you think about looking at the time? Yes. You know what I mean? That idea that like it becomes just a tool that you use, kind of like your phone. If you're not always in your phone, you know, like those people who are obsessed with like Instagram and this like the very point that you made but people who like you know even those people who use their phone for work or just as a phone to communicate when needed or wanting to that like your phone is just another device that you really don't see it until you need it that idea I think is around certain types of phones <coughs> excuse me so I have the Moto 360 I also have the Pebble Steel and also got a pebble time. You also have an addiction, is well, what I'm, what I'm, what I've gathered from. This. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse <laughs> me. You you want to go down this technologically addicted uh, realm? Because I'm just saying, do you need all of them? Well, no, I don't need. I don't need a watch. I don't. I don't. I mean, outside, I could use my work laptop. I could sell the desktop that I built if I don't want to do this podcast anymore. Sell my laptop <laughs> and sort of have all the reflective time in the world. I don't need any of this shit. I really don't. <laughs> but what I'm saying, dude, who needs 
Moto 360. No one needs I'm it. I'm sure you're gonna get the Moto 362. Anthony, you got the Pebbles. The Moto 360. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna get. I'm not gonna get the new, new Moto 360. But here's why. Because on the one hand, I'm I'm definitely a tech geek, and I got those things because I am that guy that just loves geeky stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But then on the flip side of things, right? I I am a person who always loved using a watch. I didn't need a watch, especially when I was younger. I didn't have to keep time. And now as a professional, I also need a watch. But I'm not even going to make my use case scenario as a professional. I'm not. What I will argue for is, as a person who just wears a watch on a daily basis, when I was in college, in high school, even in middle school, now as a professional, when I'm not working, you know, I just have a watch on. Why? Because I like to tell the time. And I, when I look down at my wrist, I love to just see the time and be done with it. Now, with a smartwatch, you can look down. You can also see the weather. You can also see the time of day. You can also see what day it is, what week it is. Some other watches do that. Not the weather, per se, but they do other, other things. All right, Donald, so you're not telling us anything new. Other watches, dumb watches, if you will, have done that. Well, what about this? I get a subtle tap on my wrist. Maybe when I look down, and it's already there. Um, maybe I do get that subtle tap, and it tells me, that I got a message. But not only does it tell me it has a message, it tells me what the message is. Let's say I want to reply to somebody. Let's say I got groceries in my bag. I can hit a button, I can just speak a quick reply, and the person gets my reply. You know? But you see, but you see, here, two, but, but, two points in response to that. Okay. You got groceries in your hand. Don't respond. Simple as that. I mean, I get what you're going for, and I totally agree with you. And you made me actually rethink my point because I saw an article for a device, I think it was on The Verge, it was a, or no, I think it was on Polygon. It's a device that is essentially, <coughs> you put it underneath a, a normal watch, I'm not gonna call it a dumb watch because I find that, as someone who wears a normal watch, I find that insulting. Okay, you I'm put so, it under I, I a normal watch well. and it gives you some of those smart features. That is a device that I would buy in a heartbeat because I get, the desire the desirable aspect of you know okay you get little notification taps and vibrates and bleeps and bloops and lights that's cool i'm all for that i actually really would like a device like that my problem is in exactly what you described where it's like okay now i got to take action on this notification now but here's, here's my, here's my point here's my here's my here. point though here's my point though right you don't have to if i didn't have a smartwatch and i had a normal watch and I was walking down the street, I had groceries in my hand, and I get a beep in my side. You know, it's a use case, right? And then when I say a use case in this instance, I'm talking about I could stop, and I could either know that somebody's trying to call me that I was supposed to get a call from, or I could just ignore it and keep walking and leave my phone on vibrate in my pocket. I don't have to, you know. With my Pebble, it doesn't have any lights. It actually functions off of ambient light. It has a backlight for sure, but it doesn't beep or bloop. It gives you a, a tap on your wrist. I could look down for a f less than half a second, and I could either keep it moving or not, just the same way as I look down at my time and keep it moving or not. I'm not saying this solves a problem, and I don't even think in a lot of ways the type of watches, that, smart watches that I'm talking about shouldn't augment your phone because it does the same thing. When I was wearing the Moto 360, the thing lit up, you know, and then I had to swipe on it and whatever. But even with the case of like the Moto 360 or other watches, you could just set it to just be there. And it slowly just adds, a, it makes more robust your watch experience. And you could choose to reply or you can choose not to reply. I think if you think of it as you ultimately have the choice, and if you're the type of person who always feels like you're tied into it, and, and I get it, you know, even like your most chill, reflective person will feel more plugged in to the world around you by this. But I think if you think of it in the context of a person who's already inclined to wear a watch, somebody who's already inclined to just live their life, and it's a device that bleeds away, when I wear my Pebble, I didn't feel like I was wearing a smartwatch. I was wearing a watch. It was lightweight, it was on my wrist, and I didn't even think about it. I complained last week about the scratches that were on my watch because I just do everything that I do in my normal day, even when I'm not at work.
when it comes to the Moto 360, I felt more like I had a smartwatch and it was more invasive. And that's why I liked it less, especially Android's um, UI. It's very techy and geeky. And then the geek part of me loved it. But the person who just wanted a straight up watch, I was bored after a while. And, it, and the presentation of its UI elements and the way you navigate it lended itself more to a phone on your wrist. And for people who want that, that's their choice. And I'm fine with it. Nobody needs it. For people who want to go the more pebble route or the subdued Android wear that's always on silent or whatever and you use it when you want to, that's for them too. I'm in that category. If I didn't have a pebble, I would just get a regular watch. And if I'm walking down the street and with my groceries in my bag, I could still choose to take out my phone or not. But when I have the pebble on, I don't have to stop and pull out my phone. I can ch make the same choice, but just use my watch to make the choice. And it falls right back into the background. It's just a tool. Uh, and so I really think it depends on your perspective. That doesn't mean to rebut everything you said, um, but I think it sort of opens and sharpens our lens as to the particulars that come with you know, the perspective of the, of the consumer. And as a person who always just really liked using a watch, it extended that functionality for me. And I don't think of it as in being in, as intrusive. As the Moto 360 was, the more I used that device, it was m a little bit more intrusive. The screen was brighter. The way I reacted to notifications wasn't as simple. It was a little bit more complicated in the sense that, you know, you had to swipe. It couldn't just... People who say, like... Um, the Pebble should have a touchscreen, or the people who want it to be more techy and more like a phone. Whereas I was perfectly fine with it being buttons, because just like on a regular watch, if I want to start the stopwatch, I don't even have to look down. I just know the button presses and I'm done with it. I have my use. And then it bleeds away on my wrist, and I don't think about it for a week and a half until I have to charge it. A week and a half is a little bit up there, but on the Pebble time, I get about a week and a half because I don't use it a lot. I just use it when I get correspondence, even with my work schedule. You know, I often know that I have to pick up kids, and I'm going back into the, you know, my, my use case, but it doesn't stop my flow of work at all. It actually just enhances it. It actually does the same thing it does when I'm on my downtime. I mean, I would hope so, because that is primarily its, its function, is to enhance your workflow and not inhibit it. So. Right, or just, a, I think it just, to them. I think it's less about enhancing, I think those smartphone and smartwatch experiences are, that are about enhancing really do bolster things and make it more flashy, which feeds right into your points. But I think, depending on how you approach the smartwatch and which smartwatch you pick up, it, it actually just streamlines the experience. And by no means is it um, a problem beforehand, um, but it, it adds a convenience, I think what it is. It doesn't solve a problem, but it adds a convenience for it. And whereas other smartwatch experiences complicate the experience. And for the geeky, that's fine. Like sometimes I get in a geeky mode, I'll break out the 360, be like, hey, hey, I can look up Obama's age on my wrist. But then I get bored after a while and I go back to sort of the, the streamlining of my experience. Definitely, would I say it's a first world problem? Or probably, but not in that it's a problem but that it's actually a convenience. There are certain products that come out that are conveniences that only streamline and don't necessarily solve. You know what I mean? I know. I, I totally agree with you. Yeah. Did you just add a bunch of exclamation points in the rundown? No. What, are, we don't, what on earth are you talking about? You know what? I know it's you because it actually has your initials next to it. You liar. Yep. You jerk. Okay. Stop. <laughs> Okay, we're going to move on from this. Um, do you have any last thoughts on that, though? No, I think you summarized it pretty nicely, actually. Um, I don't have general complaints with the idea behind smartwatches and that whole modern solutions to modern problems or whatever, but it's mm -hmm. not for me. Maybe eventually it will be if I see a compelling uh, reason for one, but as of yet, I am unconvinced, except for that device, which... I will include in the notes for this because I think people, if people are listening who are like me, um, 
it seems like advice that's interesting and it's i think it's like a hundred bucks and it's going to be shipping i think they had a kickstarter it's going to be shipping like next spring or something so i also want to apologize to our listeners not only are you hearing persistent drumming but you're now also listening to church bells and street traffic um high quality podcast indeed um <laughs> But we shall move forward. We're in our final segment here. We're also running up on our runtime, more or less. Um, and this is also the part where I will tune out and let um, Sir Anthony take over. Okay, um, I won't. I won't include spoilers. I can discuss the campaign. We're, we're referring to Halo Five, by the way. Um, okay, yes. I can discuss the campaign without spoiling it because I feel like that would be a little bit uh, ostracizing to the to those who don't want to be spoiled, and that's fair. Um, I do have a full review up on indev.news, so check that out. Um, there's, you know, some there's a an interesting video at the end of one of the things I encountered, which I think is pretty funny. Um, but Halo Five, after playing through it fully, is a pretty good game. You know, nothing more, nothing less. Pretty good. Is it my favorite Halo to date? No. What is your favorite is, Halo to date? My compare. favorite Halo to date is pro- I'm probably tied between Halo 2 and 3. Really? Um, okay. Yeah, it leans in the direction of Halo 3 because I had uh, more co-op experience with Halo 3 with a friend of mine, um, which was amazing. We went, we beat through uh, Legendary in a, I think it was like an eight-hour just straight-through session. It was amazing. It was amazing. Um, and then we last year when the master chief collection came out we did the same thing for halo 2 again but it took us like 15 hours so um we should actually do that as a special video for in dev for halo 4 maybe yeah sure i mean it's i've got them all so can you can you actually play halo 4 um is it possible to play halo 4 from a 360 and an xbox one can they talk to each other i believe they can well, we're gonna investigate this, folks. You hear it? You hear first live on our podcast. Yeah, first, yeah. Because uh, I already own a copy of that, so we'll look into this. Yeah. Um. So, Halo Five. Halo Five story. I am so excited. I I can't I can't lie. I mean, the people who reviewed it and said, "Oh yeah, the story leaves you on a cliffhanger. Oh, it's not that good. Oh, there wasn't enough Master Chief. Screw all those people. I'm gonna give you the real deal. Fan f- focused." review the story it is amazing it's not and i say amazing and i probably shouldn't overuse that word because it'll give you the idea that it's perfect it's not perfect but if you're a fan of the story and a fan of the lore it does things that make you want more story and i think that is a mark of success for a game if i want to know more about this if i want to play the next game they have won and I think they have definitely won with Halo 5. Um, a couple of criticisms to get those out of the way. I would agree that there isn't enough Master Chief and Blue Team. Um, it's unfortunate. I think he only has three missions, to be honest. Yeah, the other reviews have pointed that out. Three missions. That, while the missions are substantial, it still seems heavily balanced in the direction of Fireteam Osiris. And in the review, I mentioned that even some of the missions for Fireteam Osiris literally involve walking to an NPC, talking to them, walking to some other NPC, talking to them, and then, boom, the mission's done. I'm, I'm talking literally five minutes. Like, I think mission six or seven is just walk over here, talk to Dr. Halsey, walk over there, talk to someone else, and boom. Um, and that confused me because... I was thinking, okay, this kind of breaks the progression a little bit. I'm playing through this game. I just got through this long extended mission of killing, you know, Covenant fools like some sort of Rambo, futuristic armored Rambo. And then now I just have a fetch quest in the middle of Halo 5. It just kind of broke me out of that, you know, really impactful story. So that's one criticism I would have, but overall... I really enjoy Spartan Lock more so than I thought I would. I'm not a fan of Spartan 4s from a story perspective because I don't think they're as cool as Spartan 2s simply due to the fact that the augmentations aren't like the same and you know, they're volunteers, but you do get a few instances of 
the sort of showdown between Spartan 2s and Spartan 4s, obviously with the premise being that Fireteam Osiris is going after Blue Team. Um, and I, I enjoyed that, although I think the results of that showdown were a little bit unrealistic. I won't spoil anything there, but I mean, once you play through that mission, you'll you'll understand what I mean. But there are a lot of changes in this story. Some for the better, some for the worse, in my opinion. I would say that the cliffhanger that people complained about is problematic simply because I think 343 announced that they will not have story DLC for Halo 5. Really? Really? Yeah. So we are basically, this is where the story ends until Halo 6 or whatever game's coming out. And they don't do a yearly release, really. Yeah, and Halo is not the kind of first-person shooter that does a yearly release, so I'm a little anxious because... That's a long time to wait. I mean, Halo 5 was announced at E3 in 2013, and it's 2015 now. So that was a two-year turnaround. Um, And Halo 4 came out in 2012. So if I have to wait that long for Halo 6, and there's no intervening story bits like even if they come out with more books like that'll be that'll be fine for me i'll read those i haven't been reading the comic series but i've heard you know good things about that if they do another um hunt the truth sort of podcast uh like radio thing that they did for halo 5 i'd be okay with that but we need something i'm sure they will i mean think about like because it came out with Halo in 2001, Halo 2 in 2004, Halo 3 in 2007. So there's about three-year turnarounds. And then they came out with um, Halo 3 ODST the next year. You know, very controversial, whatever. Um, and then they came out with Halo Reach 2010, that's two years. Halo 4, 2012, another two years. Halo 5, Master Chief Collection, obviously it's just a rehash. And then Halo 5 came out. 20, 2015, and then of course you have the Halo Wars, which they come out with a sequel that added, you know, to the lore. And then you have, um, you know, I don't know if they're doing this with Spartan Five, so I guess not. But in the Halo Four, you also had that Spartan, that that those little extra missions that helped add to the universe. Oh yeah, the Spartan Ops. Spartan, yeah, you had Spartan Ops there. Obviously, I don't think there's something like that here, but I'm I'm sure they're gonna do something, even if the next game is like an ODST type of thing, which. As a full game, you might have been upset, but it did add to the universe and change up the formula, which is cool. Um, so I wouldn't be worried. I, I think it's too lucrative for them not to. I know, but at the same time, I'm worried because I don't... <sighs> My opinion, as much as I love Halo, I really wish at some point Halo's story just got spun off into a, a book series because... The game has so much potential, and, you know, a nine-hour campaign doesn't do doesn't, it justice. Like, yeah, it doesn't do it justice, because you don't get, story, like, all the, the playtime, the nine hours, that's mostly you shooting stuff, where there is no narrative being advanced. If they just wrote a book, I would be all over it, because you know, I've read all the Halo books. Like, I love the lore so much more than any other game of its type, like Destiny a game that I've played nonstop since the summer has a story that I'm mildly interested in, but because they have no idea how to put a story in their game, I have no interest. And I'm like, well, Bungie made Halo. I love Halo's story. Now Bungie's making Destiny with basically no story. And now we have 343 making Halo with an even better story than had been in Bungie's Halo games. I'm. I really, really love where three four three is taking Halo as far as the story goes, but I need more. Yeah, you know what I think. You know, I actually I feel like when I play something like Halo, Halo two, um, definitely Halo three, and even Halo four, I felt like I got enough story. And I feel like this is the first Halo game, and definitely when you think about Halo three ODST, even with the sound files being in there, even without that. The story was rich, I feel like. And so with Halo 5, people are saying, and it sounds like you're saying that there's not enough story. And I think I heard somebody in a review say that you have to like watch the the miniseries, like the film content they've been coming out with, mm-hmm. and like read a book or two on Blue Team 
to really get a glimpse of it because we haven't heard of Blue Team in the other games. You only know the members of the Blue Team if you read the past lore. And so that's why I know about Blue Team, even though I haven't played Halo 5, because I've watched the lore. Even Halo Legends, right? Some of it yeah. is goofy, but some of it actually gives you an insight into the lore. Um, and at Halo 5, if you don't know a lot of it, it can seem shallow, especially if this is your first Halo game. You're not even, gonna... even me, as someone who has read every single Halo book, excluding... I think the Thursday War, which is I started but never finished for some reason. I've read all the those Halo books. I know the lore. I know who Blue Team is. And I think I'm not saying the story is shallow, I guess. It's thin. But I'm saying that for people who love the lore, the game doesn't give you enough story. For people who don't know the lore that well, they think it's shallow because they're confused by what's happening. Like who know like what is the domain? If you've never read the Forerunner um, trilogy, you're not going to know what the domain, the significance of the, the the domain, or the mantle, or the didact, really, from Halo 4, or the, you know, the Prometheans, or any of these things. You're, you, that's all stuff that was introduced in the games to people who'd never read the books. I read the books, and Halo 5 to me is like, whoa, what is happening? Everything that I thought I knew about things is changing. All the characters are changing. I don't know how to how to handle this, but I'm gonna have to learn because I have to wait a couple of years till the next game to find out, and that that bothers me. Yeah, uh, I mean, it, I I would say it's a good problem for them to have because I really want like if Halo Six came out tomorrow, I would drop money on it without hesitation. But you know, two years from now, maybe I'll be maybe I'll be done with Halo. That's not yeah. gonna happen. I know that I won't be, but you know, who knows. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. I think I think ultimately, I think people wanted more from the campaign. I mean, I haven't even read all the books. I've read some of the books. Um, I haven't gotten around to reading all of them, but I would say... Have, have you read the Forerunner books? No. Um, you, so, those are the most important. Can we, can we can talk about... all the other ones. Hold on. Can we just talk about what's out there really quickly just for our fans? So we have we have the original three. We have the, the prequel one, The Fall of Reach. Then you have The Flood, which is a retelling of Halo 1, which I loved. It was a novelization of like Halo 1. And then you have First Strike, which began to open up things. Then you had um, Contact Harvest, which gave us a little prequel um, to the whole Halo universe, which I loved. Because it also focused on Avery Johnson. Yep. Um, then you have uh, Ghost of Onyx. Ghosts, yeah. And then Cold Protocol. I think. Yeah, yeah. Then Cold Protocols. I started reading Cold Protocol, and I stopped. And then after that, you had something called Glasslands. Yep. And I didn't read that yet. Um... But obviously, I read Contact Harvest, so I do know about some things, right? And then you have these Forerunner books, right? These three Forerunner books. And I think that's it, right? Uh, no, there's the Thursday War, um, which came out, I think, a year ago. Yeah. And another one. And then the Forerunner one. So, yeah, there's like there are the three Forerunner, Forerunner ones and then like two other uh, Halo specific novels. Yeah. And then there's a comic series, which is different. Right. So I think especially in a world of lore, even coming up as fans, like you want it more like like I would say Halo two and three, you know, and a lot of the games really sort of show that you can shoot stuff and still get story. And what people are saying about Halo five is that that's not as much of the case, especially since we've tied in so much of the background lore. Um, even still, um, we want it more story in the game itself. We don't want necessarily cinematic movies, you know, for five hours necessarily, though I would love it. I'd be okay with that. Uh, yeah, as diehard fans, we love it. But, like, there seems to be something missing. And it seems like it's almost on the content end in terms of how they fleshed out the story and explained things. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it feels to me like they had so much more story, but they cut it out. Like, mm. and I, I, I've read that in reviews. That was a sentiment that was shared. And I get that. But it's frustrating. Yeah. You know? Well, ironically enough, um, the drums and the church bells and the horrible traffic um, just ended, and so is our podcast. So um, that's unfortunate. Um, it's actually irritating from a production standpoint, but hey, I guess we got to roll with the punches, huh? We're yeah, gonna... we're real people too. We bleed. We feel. Yeah. We have drums in the background from time to time. I don't. Just like you. I don't think that's an ad. It's just going to last the test of time. But hopefully, Halo <laughs> and maybe not Apple will. Well, um, we're a little bit over time, but that's okay. Um, we are going to close here, I think. I think we could also talk about Halo for a very long time. 
That being said, um, again, I am Arm of Justice. You can find me on Xbox if I'm ever on there through that name, a.k.a. Donald. Um, you're also listening to Anthony, our co-editor-in-chief of InDev, that is Humanity in Development. You can find us at indev.news. Actually, N-E-W-S, not .com, not .net, .news. It's innovative, it's new, it's fresh. Um, <laughs> I know, it sounds like a really bad commercial. Um, but anyway, folks, um, thanks for tuning in. Join us next time when we discuss more things related to gaming, technology, humanity. Like always, those things are continuously in development. Development. Ha, ah, I can't speak. Thank you and goodbye. And for those who are listening after our exit jingle, I keep telling Sir Anthony here we should do an acapella version of our jingle for the intro and outro. It is a horrible idea. It is a great idea. You know, I'm probably going to splice into this file uh, the little moment where we did harmonize before. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) You know that, right? They're going to hear that. It's going to happen. Go ahead. Go for it. Yeah. Um, I can feel it calling in the air tonight. From me, Panima goes walking, and when she passes each time, she passes goes ah. And so you're probably listening to, you probably just heard us uh, sing just now. So uh, I hope you guys enjoy. Um, we should make an acapella group, Anthony. I think that's what Indef's focus should be. It should. Let's rebrand it. Yeah. Um, do 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 do. Do do ba do do in dev in dev podcast oh yeah ba do bop shwa wa. This is so weird. It is weird. Pitch Perfect three. We're gonna be starring in it. You heard it here first, folks. You heard it here first and probably last. All right. I'm gonna end this before we embarrass ourselves further. Ship has sailed. listening to the podcast good folks of the world in dev that's humanity and tech in this case but a lot of other things in development a peculiar blog this is our fourth recording and we have a special guest this morning um a returning britney smith also writer for the blog we are also your hosts donald and anthony um, we are coming live to you from different corners of this wonderful borough, Brooklyn. The time is now 9.28 a.m. Say good morning, folks. Howdy, howdy. I'm not so sure that time information is particularly relevant. This could be like...